Okay, good afternoon and welcome to this meeting of the Conveners Group. Can I uh, start by welcoming uh, Edward Mountain uh, to his first meeting uh, of the group as the new Ch Convener of the Net Zero Energy and Transport Committee and also put on record my thanks to his predecessor, uh, Dean Lockhart. Uh, we have received apologies from Stuart McMillan, uh, Convener of the DPLR Committee. Uh, this meeting uh, will be taking place in public and your microphones will be operated uh, automatically. It's the second of our meetings with the uh, First Minister in this session. So I welcome the First Minister to the meeting. Um, it will last between uh, an hour and a half, an hour and three quarters. We agreed to focus uh, today's meeting on cost of living framed around the programme for government, but inevitably there will be other issues that conveners want to raise and I hope and expect we'll be able to do that through the course of the meeting. Um, uh, that will require questions to be uh, fairly brief um, and similarly uh, responses. Um, I, I will do my best to call um, everybody um, for the questions they've indicated uh, in advance, but I'm sure there will be uh, issues uh, that arise and people will want to respond to that, so we'll hopefully allow a bit of flexibility uh, for that. But um, we're going to kick off, uh, as I say, in the uh, broad realm of cost of living. and I'm going to invite uh, Eleanor Whittam to start with the first questions. Eleanor. Thank you very much, Convener, and good afternoon, First Minister. Last week, the UK Government introduced its mini-budget. Has the Scottish Government carried out any assessment of the impact that this will have on the measures introduced here in Scotland to tackle poverty and the cost crisis? And can the First Minister outline how the Scottish Government is working with local authorities in the third sector to support people, and what additional fiscal flexibilities do you think are required to ensure that the Scottish Government is able to continue to deliver for those most in need? First Minister. Uh, thank you. I will try to, uh, as briefly as I can, uh, presiding officer, take the, the three parts of that question. Firstly, in terms of our analysis of the, the budget on Friday, as you can imagine, uh, given events since Friday, that is very much a, an ongoing exercise. I think it is quite hard to overstate the impact that Friday's budget will have on poverty inequality and the financial stress that millions of people are going to be uh, living under. Uh, obviously much of the immediate attention uh, after the Chancellor spoke on Friday was on the, the distributional impact of some of these policies themselves and you know, my view uh, I think is well known. Uh, I think there uh, is it was very difficult I think to defend uh, the policies in those terms. You know, the, statistics are, are well known by now, the vast bulk of the, the added borrowing that is funding tax cuts is going to the very, very richest in society. I think 45 per cent uh, or thereabouts of the value of those tax cuts will go to the top 5 per cent of income earners in, in the country. As the IFS set out, only uh, those over £155,000 will benefit at all. Everybody else below that uh, income threshold will lose. So that, in terms of our analysis, uh, will obviously make those at the very top of the income wealth uh, spectrum uh, even richer uh, and wealthier. But because that raises effectively the relative poverty line, it, it puts more people into relative poverty. So that is a matter of concern. Um, but I think since Friday, we are beginning to re not beginning. We are uh, very starkly realising now that the wider impacts of the budget are likely to be much greater than those immediate impacts. So, obviously, since Friday, we've seen the collapse in uh, the the pound that will fuel inflation, which will make the cost of living crisis worse. We're already seeing the cost of borrowing. Uh, increasing cost of borrow government borrowing increasing, uh, but there is now, I think, uh, the inevitability of a sharp rise in interest rates, which is going to have a very profound impact on uh, those with mortgages, those with credit card debt, and that will push more people into very serious uh, financial stress. Um, and you know, we've had warnings in the last 24 hours from the IMF. We've just had the quite extraordinary, as a word that's overused in political discourse, I think it is appropriate this morning, intervention of the Bank of England concerned about serious financial instability, you know, speculation this morning of pension funds uh, about to fall over. So we have the Bank of England staging an emergency intervention uh, not to respond to some external shock uh, or global event, but to try to reduce the damage of the UK government's own policies. I mean, it is really 
extraordinary and unprecedented. And I, I, I do think there needs to be uh, very urgent and immediate action taken. I do not think we should uh, see the policies announced on Friday as inevitable. Uh, now, I think, as an immediate symbol of some kind of good sense uh, being restored, the decision to abolish the top rate of tax should be reversed. Um, and clearly, that would uh, have an impact uh, on some of what I spoke about earlier on. Uh, so I, I don't think it's possible to overstate the damage of this budget to what we are trying to do in terms of poverty and tackling inequality. But in the wider sense, the UK, as we speak right now, is in the midst of an unfolding and rapidly deteriorating economic and financial crisis. And it's going to be ordinary people uh, that pay the price of that. Um, I don't think we've had a more serious uh, economic situation, uh, possibly even including 2008, which was a, a global financial crash. But in the UK, probably not a more serious situation in uh, our uh, memories. So, uh, that has a big impact, and therefore, to come back to your question, our analysis has to continue as this situation unfolds. Um, second part of your question, briefly, we continue to discuss with local government partners and with the third sector. Uh, so, obviously, uh, we have already taken some decisions that were set out in the programme for government uh, to uh, increase support for advice agencies, giving help to people on the front line. Uh, we have set out uh, work around uh, rent levels and uh, we will continue to do everything we can to support local government. We've uh, most recently had uh, discussions with COSLA to try to give uh, decent pay rises to those uh, working in local government. Uh, lastly, in terms of flexibilities, I think everything we're seeing right now tells us that we need far greater economic and financial levers at our disposal so that we're not at the mercy of decisions taken elsewhere and we can have the full suite of powers and levers that other governments have to try not just to stabilise the kind of crisis that has been created right now but to build the kind of economy uh, and an economy based on equality and well-being that I think there is a majority in this parliament that wants to see. Okay, I'm going to come to Edward Martin now. Uh, thank you, Convener. Um, good afternoon, First Minister. Uh, the committee produced a report on its inquiry into energy prices in July, for which we still await a response. Are there any new packages that the Scottish Government are able to provide to help households with their energy bills? First Minister. Uh, well, we'll continue uh, to take whatever action uh, we can. Uh, I set out in the programme for government some of the action we were taking to help with the wider cost of living. Energy prices, as um, all uh, conveners are aware, um, the, the, the factors driving the increase in energy prices and also uh, the access to the levers and resources, energy market regulation, access to the kind of borrowing that we've seen uh, the UK government, not uh, for the tax cuts, but for the energy uh, costs help access. These are not levers that the Scottish government holds. We do, however, uh, have some uh, levers that we can use to reduce the wider cost of living pressures, which is why uh, we have, and the emergency legislation will be published uh, shortly, uh, outlined the plans for the rent freeze and uh, the moratorium on evictions. Uh, we have, uh, obviously through Social Security Scotland, the winter heating um, help uh, fund uh, that we will bring to bear. Um, and we're looking at everything we can do to try to help people with the, the costs that they uh, that they are incurring, but uh, we need to continue to see all governments at every level exercise the responsibilities we have, and on energy costs, as we have uh, seen, we need to see action from the UK government. The action that was announced um, a week or so ago um, was very welcome, but even with that, we are going to see in Scotland and across the UK significant and rising numbers of people living in fuel poverty, including extreme fuel poverty. Mike. Uh, thank you, First Minister. Uh, where you do have the levers of power and drilling down into the report, 17% of homes in Scotland are off-grid using oil for heating and sometimes cooking. They are not covered by Ofgem, and so if they do not pay for their oil, they will not get any more delivered. What help is the Scottish Government planning to offer these households? First Minister. Well, again, you know, these are actually levers that lie with the UK government largely in terms of regulation of uh, these matters. Through financial assistance that we can provide, uh, we will continue to look at uh, what we can do. But I come back to a more general point here in terms of the finite nature of, of the budget we have and the inability to access resources in the way that the UK government, where most of these levers lie, 
uh, is able to do. Obviously, which I know is uh, an issue of huge interest to the, the committee that you're now convening. Uh, the work we're doing around heat and energy efficiency more generally is important in this regard, not just responding to the short-term pressures, but uh, making sure that we're dealing with the longer-term issues here that reduce energy costs while reducing the carbon uh, impact of how we heat our homes as well. Finally, briefly, Edward Martin. Um, okay, so finally, First Minister, do you agree that, with the committee that we should be calling on electricity companies to make sure that the prepayment charges on electric meters are reflective of the standard tariffs and not subjected uh, to additional charges? First Minister. Um, yes, in, in general, I do. Um, I convened a, a summit uh, a few weeks back uh, with some of the key energy companies and issues around prepayment meters were one of the issues uh, we spoke about. As you know, there are you know, complexities around that, but there is a serious inequity in terms of those who are on prepayment meters and uh, the, the kinds of action uh, that energy companies are able to take, including some of the uh, potential actions that you've spoken about there, were discussed at that summit, and I would continue to encourage the energy companies to uh, take that kind of action to reduce uh, that inequity that exists. Thank you. I'm going to come to Gillian Martin. Now. Thank you, Convener. Um, I'd like to ask First Minister, morning, First Minister, um, about the impact of fuel costs and the cost of living crisis on two aspects of health. One is the impact it's going to have on the provision of NHS services um, with, the, with regards to the increased costs that they face, and the other is on the health of our citizens and those presenting to our NHS and what the government's assessment of that is? So in terms of uh, those two aspects, firstly, the, the increase in the cost of energy you know, clearly affects uh, health boards because they have to pay the energy bills of hospitals um, and health centres. So as uh, more of our health budget is taken up with paying rising costs of energy, then clearly that means there's less of that budget can be spent on frontline patient care. So it has a very, very direct impact. Uh, one of the issues we are still seeking uh, clarity, well, I think we've got some basic clarity, at least I hope we do, but still uh, seeking more detail on, is the extent to which the UK government's announcement on help for businesses with energy costs covers hospitals and schools and other public uh, buildings. Uh, we have had I, I think clarity that it will uh, cover. I, I know that uh, the Chancellor said that the government will provide a price guarantee equivalent uh, to the one provided uh, for households for all businesses, and they have given us the indication that that includes schools and hospitals, but we've not yet seen any of the detail of that. So if that follows through into what we, we hope it will, then some of that impact is going to be mitigated. Uh, but as with businesses and individuals, even with those uh, welcome schemes that have been announced, they're still going to be facing increases in the cost of energy. So that is a matter of concern. Um, secondly, which is you know, also of significant concern, but I think this is going to be something that we need to monitor on an ongoing basis and, and will be multifaceted, is the impact. A bit like COVID in, in many respects, the impact of the, you know, the pressure and the anxiety uh, that will be felt by people will exacerbate mental health conditions. Given that we are, and every time I, I say something like this, I, I still have to sort of remind myself that we are sitting here in supposedly one of the richest countries in the world talking about this, but growing numbers of people unable to afford to heat their homes, that is you know, potentially going to feed through into physical uh, illness too. So, you know, these are going to be added pressures for the National Health Service, for social care services that we need to work with uh, the NHS and social care to, to both understand uh, and to monitor and to ensure that as far as we can, uh, we are supporting and equipping the NHS to deal with them. Jillian Martin, I know you've got other issues you want to raise. In I, well, I do have a follow-up follow que question um, on yeah. this specifically. Last night, uh, Sky News reported the former Bank of England deputy uh, Governor S Sir Charlie Bean said that spending cuts, the spending cuts of the UK government announced last week, and this is quote, could finish the NHS. Now, obviously, he's talking about the NHS in, in, in England there. But I, I just want your response to that, because you, you, you read that, and the spending cuts are affecting the Scottish 
budget as well, the Scottish situation as well. What is your response to that as, as leader of the Scottish Government? First Minister. I, I, I'm profoundly concerned by, by all of these things. You know, we, we are working within a, a spending envelope right now, effectively determined at the, the last UK Government spending review. The UK Government appear to have indicated that they are not intending to open that. That was set at the time inflation was, I think, 3 or 4 per cent. It's now you know, almost in double figures. So not to open that is eroding the budgets that we have right now. I set this out in the week we published the programme for government. The, the budget that we passed as a parliament at the start of this financial year is already worth £1.7 billion less than it was because of the effects of inflation. But there's an added effect here, going back to the unfolding economic crisis. In order to restore market confidence, in order uh, to undo the damage that has been done, I think everybody looks at the situation and thinks that deep spending cuts uh, on the part of the UK government are going to be inevitable and inescapable. And that is profoundly concerning, given the, the situation we, we are in. That affects all public services, but given the importance of the National Health Service and the share of the budget uh, that uh, the National Health Service uh, relies on, then it is particularly worrying for it. I mean, I and it's rightly uh, and properly regularly the topic of questioning and debate in this parliament. The government I lead is absolutely rightly responsible for the performance of NHS Scotland, and, and I don't shy away from that. But the issues that we're grappling with in the NHS in Scotland, England, Wales, Northern Ireland, uh, they're not just about you know, how you manage the system. They are fundamentally uh, about the need for a massive injection of both money and people to deal with the rising demand, to deal with the effects of, of COVID. And you know, we have a fixed budget within which it is very difficult to respond uh, to that in the way that we would want to, which is why we are relying on the UK government uh, not going down the austerity spending cuts route, uh, but looking at the, the prospects over the next period. I don't think anybody uh, can be anything other than very deeply and very profoundly concerned at what might lie ahead. OK, I'm going to move on. Siobhan Bray. Thank you, convener, and good afternoon, First Minister. Can I ask, First Minister, in developing the latest programme for government, to what extent has the Scottish Government maintained its commitment to the priorities set out in the COVID recovery strategy? And has its priorities or focus on COVID recovery changed in light of the current cost crisis? First Minister. So, in terms of the... Uh, aims and objectives of the COVID recovery strategy, um, these haven't changed. You know, we saw, uh, all of us saw very starkly the disproportionate impact that COVID had on different sections of the population. Um, obviously, there were uh, issues there in terms of, uh, you know, ethnic minority communities, but also those uh, least well off suffered uh, disproportionately as a result. So as we build COVID recovery, it's important that we have a focus on uh, those inequalities. So uh, those objectives haven't changed. Clearly, the context in which uh, we are pursuing the COVID recovery strategy has changed and is rapidly changing for all the, the reasons we've been talking about. And I don't need to to go into again in, in detail. So as, as inequality is likely to, to widen as a result of the, the economic situation we're facing right now, as more people are pushed into poverty, despite our best efforts to lift people and particularly children out of poverty, we're going to see some of those effects uh, being even more pronounced. So we will need to continue to consider that strategy in light uh, of that, and uh, we will continue to do that. Okay. Um, I'll ask uh, Richard Leonard. Uh, thank you, Convener. Good afternoon, First Minister. Um, First Minister, the Public Audit Committee is arranging uh, for a full evidence session with you in connection with the uh, vessels for the Clyde and Hebrides routes. At this stage, have you ruled out that there has been any criminality? First Minister. I've got many responsibilities as First Minister. I take each and every one of them very seriously, but I don't think anybody would say that I should be the arbiter of, uh, on this or any issue 
uh, whether there has been uh, criminality. I've certainly seen uh, no uh, evidence of that, but it's not my job. We have independent authorities that are there to uh, determine uh, these issues on whatever uh, topic it is we, we're speaking about. Um, more generally, I, I know um, I will be uh, appearing at your committee um, over the next period uh, to go into these issues in uh, detail and um, I'm not sure it is true to say I'm looking forward to that opportunity, but I'm certainly uh, very uh, willing. Obviously, it's uh, my duty, uh, but I'm happy to go into all of these details with your, uh, all of these issues in detail with your committee. Thank you. Thanks for confirming that. Can I turn now to evidence that we took at the committee last week on the state of Scotland's colleges? The Auditor General told us that as many as one in three students from the most deprived areas of Scotland did not complete their course. Uh, at college last year, and the same is true of students with a disability. One in three uh, failed to complete, and uh, care experience students, the figure was as high as 40 per cent. What action uh, is the government taking uh, to avoid repetition of that uh, inequality bias in this academic year? Um, and obviously, without um, sort of trying to uh, avoid the, the, the substance of the question you've asked, we have, over the last two years, had the significant impact, not just in colleges and schools, as well of the, the pandemic and the disruption uh, to education there, which the education system is now in recovery from. But in terms of our college sector, I think the longer term trend in terms of tackling uh, inequality completion of courses, uh, the, the performance and attainment in our colleges is going in the right direction. That's not intended to be complacent. We need to make sure we continue to support our colleges uh, to achieve that. Uh, that's further education. Uh, obviously, in higher education, we're also seeing a very strong and very encouraging trend in terms of closing the attainment gap with increasing numbers of uh, young people from our more deprived communities uh, getting access to universities, which was one of the uh, key uh, targets we set uh, earlier in our tackling attainment work. I call uh, Finlay Carson. Uh, good afternoon, First, First Minister. Can I ask what your assessment is of the impact of the cost of living crisis, specifically on rural and island communities, and what specifically is the Scottish Government doing to address it? First Minister. As with all uh, aspects of poverty and inequality, uh, there is a, a disproportionate and at times uh, quite unique uh, impact on rural and remote communities. Uh, we uh, talk about poverty with the, the, the indicators and the metrics we use about poverty often misses the, the pockets of rural poverty. So there is no doubt, and Edward Mountain talked about uh, people off uh, gas grid, for example, uh, using uh, heating oil. Uh, that's just one example of many ways the you know, already higher delivery charges, for example, the, the premium there will be on, on food prices. Uh, so these are all things that will affect everybody across Scotland right now, but will affect people in rural communities uh, more generally. Uh, we seek in all of our policies to, to be uh, mindful of that and to try to uh, take account of that in our policies. So, you know, for example, this is longer term in terms of immediate, but I, I referred to earlier on the work we're doing around uh, heating in homes, decarbonising heating. There is, I think I was speaking about this in Parliament just last week at FMQs, uh, we recognise the additional costs of that in rural communities and seek to recognise that in the funding schemes that we have. So across all of our policies, we will seek to take account of that. Um, if there are a specific one you want me to go into in more detail, I'm happy to seek to do that. Um, well, the, the Rural Affairs Committee is obviously very concerned about depopulation, um, and there's many factors that contribute to, the, uh, to that. Um, we've already heard, and you've touched on it from Edward Mountain, about the, the issues facing uh, rural properties that are off the, the main gas grid. Um, but uh, rural communities are also concerned about the reduction in investment potentially from private and social landlords, uh, given the potential rent freeze. Can I, can I ask you what your assessment is? of the unintended consequences of the policy on future investment in the rural housing stock? First Minister. So, I mean, we, we have to, and, and often it's, it's what leads to frustrations on, on both sides of any particular argument. We need to do very careful assessments of, you know, the intended uh, effect of a policy, any, uh, what you've described as unintended consequences. We also have to assess policies in terms of ECHR compliance. Um, and that process uh, we are, we have gone through and are going through uh, ahead of the introduction of the emergency 
legislation. And some of the balances we have to strike, uh, I'm sure, if, forgive me, I'm not trying to be political here, but from the point, the perspective you've asked me that question will be seen as not going far enough, but from the other perspective on this issue will be seen as going too far in the, the wrong direction. These are just the, the balances we, we have to, to strike. People right now are, and you know, we announced the rent freeze, of course, before uh, the current uh, or the, the mayhem of the last few days in, in the markets and the extent of the expected increase in interest rates. That's also going to have an impact both on homeowners, those who let property and those who, who rent uh, property. And we'll need to continue to take all of that uh, into account. But rising rents, uh, not uniform across Scotland, but rising rents in particular parts of Scotland is one of uh, the serious contributors to a cost of living crisis. And going back to Edward Mountain's point, it's one of the levers we have uh, at our disposal, and I, uh, you will no doubt say too often, talk about the levers that another government uh, has and should use more, in my view. It's incumbent on me to use the levers we have at our disposal. The last point I'd make about housing provision, um, in, in particular in rural communities, our affordable housing programme, of course, is extremely strong, is continuing to progress. The, uh, costs of uh, construction inflation are clearly, you know, have impacts on that. But we continue to ensure that through that uh, wider programme, we are also mindful of the, the different housing needs in rural parts of the country. Very briefly, Finlay Carson. Yeah, but specifically, do you believe that uh, a rent freeze will reduce the investment from private and social uh, landlords in the much needed improvement to insulation and upgrade and heating systems? in rural homes that are facing fuel poverty, will it increase or decrease as a result of the policy? I, 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 I don't minutes. think that is the case. We, we obviously consider all of these issues and, and all decisions in this have to be a balance. Right now, people are struggling to pay rents. They will increasingly be struggling to pay mortgages. They're struggling to heat their homes and it's incumbent on us to do what we can to keep those costs down. I think it's important to emphasise that while we'll no doubt have uh, considerations and debate in Parliament when it comes to March next year about whether there should be a longer period for a rent freeze. This is a temporary measure to deal with the cost of living uh, crisis. So we will continue to discuss uh, the concerns that landlords have here, but we judge, and I think we rightly judge right now in the cost of living crisis, that action to keep down the costs of rents is really important uh, for people when all of the other costs that they're facing are rising so steeply. Uh, Ariane Burgess. Um, thank you, Convener, and uh, thank you, First Minister. And continuing that theme of housing, ensuring that we have sufficient affordable housing will be a key element in the response to the cost of living crisis. How confident are you that we will be able to deliver the 110,000 affordable homes by 2030, particularly in the context of increasing costs for construction and shortage of key skills? And do you think that building 110,000 new homes continues to be the best way to meet Scotland's housing needs? Minister. Uh, well, firstly, yes, I do believe it is uh, one of the most important parts of, of what we're doing to, to meet Scotland's housing needs. We have a, a mixed tenure uh, housing system in Scotland, and that will continue to be the case. Uh, but access to affordable um, and uh, social uh, rented housing is fundamental as, as part of that overall mix. Uh, we've now started uh, the delivery against the 110,000 uh, target. And just as a reminder, the target is that 70 per cent of those will be for social rent. Uh, and going back to uh, Finlay Carson's uh, point earlier on, uh, 10 per cent will be in remote rural and island communities. Um, we see, and you'll be very familiar with this, progress with the affordable housing supply programme varies quarter to quarter. There's a, a whole host of factors that, that influence that, but the, the progress so far um, is good and, and gives us confidence in our ability to meet uh, this uh, target. I think the, the next uh, statistics actually will be published at the end of October. Um, there are as there is in almost every uh, area of government responsibility right now, there are very serious headwinds. So construction inflation uh, is an issue that will be concerning uh, those who are building social and affordable housing right now. I know I've had discussions with housing associations in my own constituency about some of, of these pressures. Uh, but nevertheless, we continue to see a strong programme um, and strong delivery there. Um, and we'll continue to take the action that we need to take to ensure that that 
it continues to be the case. Again, Burgess. Thank you for that. And you touched on your own discussions with housing associations and in evidence that the committees heard on this issue, the affordable housing issue, witnesses have questioned the financial capacity of social landlords to invest in decarbonising their existing stock in addition to developing new homes and also keeping the affordability of tenants' rents. How do you think that we can manage these three aims together? First Minister. Well, I mean, obviously, the, the housing regulator um, has got a key part to play here in, in assessing and monitoring the financial uh, robustness of uh, social registered social landlords. It uh, published a report earlier this year which showed that the, the financial performance of RSLs remained robust, but it also recognised uh, the significant challenges that lie ahead. Uh, Recovering from the impact of COVID is, is obviously a challenge, but disruption in global supply chains that you know, have been partly caused by COVID continuing situation in China, the war in uh, Ukraine, and the current situation right now all exacerbating that. Uh, so the, the housing regulator has uh, made clear that social landlords should be continuing to, to challenge every aspect of their expenditure as necessary um, and also keep rents as affordable uh, as possible. And that's relevant in the context of the, the rent freeze that I was speaking about earlier on. Um, so it's important that we continue to work with the sector uh, through the regulator, but more generally to help it manage the challenges it faces and deliver on these three aims, which remain as important as ever. And M. Burgess. Thank you for that. Um, so the committee has been looking at a range of ways to tackle the affordable housing issue, not just building, and so we've been looking at the empty homes, the short-term lets, and so on and so forth. I'm also interested here in the Scottish Government's response to the issue of second homes. Does the First Minister think that more needs to be done to manage demand for second homes in a way that does not encroach on people accessing housing? And if so, what are our options? First Minister. Um, in short, yes, I do think we have to consider uh, how we... Uh, achieve and retain the best balance in terms of the housing provision. You know, everybody, and uh, we may come on later on, I don't know, to, in another context, a discussion about uh, how we're trying to embed human rights in our approach to government. And, you know, one of the most fundamental human social rights is the right to a roof over your head and, and the right to a home. So we need to make sure that while we want to encourage people to come and live in Scotland and we want to you know, encourage people to uh, spend time in Scotland, uh, we have a housing system that meets the primary needs uh, of the, the population. And there are different ways. There are obviously the approach to council tax on second homes. There are you know, issues around planning, for example, that we need to keep under, under review. Uh, but I, I do think new build is a key part of growing the overall supply. But as we do that, also looking at changing use or, or bringing uh, accommodation that has been in the private rented sector into the social rented sector. When I visited Shelter uh, the day after the programme for government, that was one of the points they were making. Um, I, you know, to go back to my own constituency experience, my, my constituency includes um, the wonderful part of the south side of Glasgow that is Govan Hill, which has had a massive, uh, for the, the scale of that part of the city, acquisition programme in recent years to deal with some particular challenges there, but nevertheless one that I think has wider applicability. So there's lots of different things we need to do to make sure we're providing the right number of houses in Scotland, but also the right mix and in the right places. Okay, thank you. I'm going to move on to um, the broad theme of employability and skills. I'm going to invite Kenneth Gibson to start the question. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and good afternoon, First Minister. Hey. David Heald, Emeritus Professor of Adam Smith Business School, has said that, and I quote, tackling endemic problems of inequality and poverty should be addressed not by higher benefits than the rest of the UK, but by enhanced economic performance. With productivity growth per person currently lagging behind the UK as a whole, Will the Scottish Government reconsider portfolio funding allocations to prioritise growth and boost economic performance, thereby reducing inequality and poverty? First Minister. Um, we will obviously continue to keep um, portfolio allocations under review in, in terms of our budget process every year. We you know, set out a resource spending review earlier this year. That's not a budget, so these issues will have further consideration ahead of the budget. We've also got the emergency budget review underway right now, looking 
Uh, some of the difficult decisions we need to continue to take to, to balance our budget, given the erosion of it by inflation that I spoke about earlier on, but try to free up some resource to help people with the very real challenges that are being faced right now. Obviously, the National Strategy for Economic Transformation is uh, focused on some of the issues that you have identified there, making sure that we are... Uh, promoting uh, sustainable economic growth, that we're doing that with a focus on uh, entrepreneurship and innovation, that it is sustainable economic growth, that it has you know, skills uh, underpinning it so that we deal with some of the, the productivity challenges that we have faced. I think on the upside, you know, Scotland has largely closed the productivity gap it had with the rest of the UK. It needs to go further in terms of uh, meeting that objective uh, with other countries. We continue to be a very attractive destination for inward investment. We're seeing strong performance, notwithstanding the headwinds um, around uh, some of our uh, exports. So there's lots of uh, very encouraging uh, trends within the the Scottish economy, but this is a difficult period where we need to continue to, to uh, focus on and tackle some of those fundamentals. Kenneth Gibson. Uh, thank you. Uh, funds for employability are being reduced by £57 million due to the inflationary squeeze on our budget. Is this not a false economy, given that to reduce poverty we need to enable people who are economically inactive to gain the skills necessary to, to obtain employment, particularly those furthest from the labour market? First Minister. So I think um, the Deputy First Minister set out our thinking around this when he um, set out these savings a couple of weeks ago. And I think the first point that I would want to reiterate is that these are not decisions we relish having to take. They are inescapable decisions. I, I think it is important for me to just keep repeating some of the key facts here. You know, a budget that is £1.7 billion pounds worth £1.7 billion pounds less than it was when we passed the budget because of inflation. Uh, we, we can't vary income tax in year. We can't borrow for day-to-day -day resource spending. We have, to, we have a legal obligation to balance our books, so we have to do something. Uh, we're also seeing rising costs of pay deals, for example. Um, so we, we've looked and are looking very carefully at how we can make difficult decisions, but the decisions that have the least impact on people. So employability is important. We still invest a lot in employability, but the savings that were announced was, was a careful judgment that right now, at a time when unemployment is very low, I don't think we should be complacent about any of these uh, indicators at the moment, given what's happening, but right now unemployment is very low, as probably as close to full employment as, as we will get. Um, and we have a situation of labour shortages in many parts of our economy, then what we need to try to do is focus money on, as far as we can, pay deals to attract people into areas of shortage. Um, and that's why we chose uh, to shift resource from those employability schemes into uh, the, the areas that I've, I've spoken about. So none of these are easy decisions. None of these are decisions we want to take. Um, and we have to take them as carefully as possible and be clear in the rationale that we are following uh, when we do take them. OK, I'm going to ask uh, Claire Baker next. Um, thank you. As a follow-on from the questions from um, Kenneth Gibson, so the £53 million saving on employability, we heard evidence this morning from Close the Gap that they have concerns around lack of transparency around the budget. They're not exactly sure where that cut will come in. And they expressed some concerns that it would come from the money that's there to support uh, the Parental Employability Support Fund activity. So we're looking for clarity whether it impacts on that. And also, the, we had a letter from Richard Lockhead that sets out the rationale for why this bit of the budget has been moved. It is a part of the budget that's focused on employability playing its part in reducing child poverty figures. So would you see... Would you anticipate that in the following year's budget, 23-24, we would see this type of investment being prioritised to compensate for the, the, the saving that's been made this year? First Minister. So, I think, I mean, obviously, the savings that were set out by the Deputy First Minister, there was information on that published. Obviously, all of this will be reflected in budget revisions in the normal way. Um, I'm happy to uh, make sure that your committee... <laughs> It gets a, a further communication setting out exactly uh, the, the impact of these changes in terms of where they're coming from so that there's no jubiety. I haven't heard the evidence that you've heard this morning. Uh, of course, there is continued investment in employability. I think loan parents um, and uh, you, the employability services that are 
uh, most directly uh, connected to dealing with child poverty, for example, that is important. So if there is a, a lack of clarity about that, I will undertake to make sure that we, we resolve that. In terms of, so two further points I would make, just to briefly reiterate the point I made to, to Kenny Gibson. These are not, I, I wish we weren't having to make any of these choices. So I, I'm not going to sit here and say, you know, there is absolutely no impact and nothing to worry about. These are choices we would rather not be making, but they are choices that we are forced to make and we are seeking to make the choices that have the, the strongest rationale and that have the least impact in terms of, of a, a negative impact. In terms of restoring uh, some of these budgets in future years, I can't give a, an absolute commitment to that, but we do need to keep these kind of things under review, not least because, as I've said to Kenny Gibson, the rationale for shifting some employability resource into dealing with pay pressures, for example, rests partly on the current situation with the labour market. If in six months, a year time, year's time, which is not impossible given what we're living through right now, we have a very different set of challenges in the labour market. Some of those judgments will clearly potentially be different. Um, that's part of the feature of the, you know, the, the volatility that we are experiencing right now. Um, and we need to try to manage that in the decisions we're taking as carefully as we can. Claire Baker. Thank you. And can I can also ask about the National Strategy for Economic Transformation that Mr Gibson raised. Um, the delivery plans, I think there's six delivery plans, they were due within six months, which was the start of September. Um, are you able to give an update on when the delivery plans will be published? First Minister. Um, again, I think they are due, all due to be published uh, imminently, but again, I'll get uh, specific dates. I don't have the specific dates in front of me right now, but I'm happy to provide that information to you. Okay. Clearly, yeah. Ask that because I mean, you've outlined the significant economic challenges we're facing at the moment. Has that had an impact on what is in the delivery plans? I mean, it's, I know it's a ten-year-long-term strategy, but is there, you know, has, has it taken into account the yeah. current situation we're facing? First Minister, any economic stra strategy for economic transformation and growth is clearly going to be impacted in the short term by economic. Uh, changes and trends and volatility such as we are experiencing but the, it is a 10-year strategy and much of what it is is seeking to do is about the fundamentals of the economy that actually matter uh, notwithstanding some of the, the short-term headwinds that we're facing right now so the focus on entrepreneurship for example that is about the kind of economy we're seeking to build in the longer term but in terms of the sequencing of things we do in terms of the the different impacts then of course any economic strategy doesn't exist um, in a, a sort of parallel universe to the real economy that we're living through uh, right now okay going to come to richard leonard uh, yes, yeah, just very quickly. Uh, one of the areas that the uh, Public Audit Committee has uh, concerned itself with over the last few months is the whole planning for skills agenda and what appeared to be a breakdown in the relationship between the Scottish Funding Council and Skills Development Scotland. Now, an announcement was made to Parliament last week of James Withers heading up a review of the architecture, at least, of, the, um, of that whole area. Uh, but somebody said to me yesterday, another review, another year when nothing changes. Are they right? First Minister. Um, no, I, I, I don't think uh, they are right. I, I, I just say this with a bit of a wry smile. I, I think it's one of the features of, uh, of the response to, to government. Often uh, you get people calling for reviews of things uh, when they feel that that's not been done and then when there is a review, it's the wrong thing to do. Um, so that's just a, a feature of things. Um, I think a lot of the, the issues that were raised in the Audit Scotland report about the, the skills uh, landscape have already been addressed um, and will be addressed on an ongoing uh, basis and I think the work that James Withers who I think is somebody who's got you know massive uh, respect for the work he's done with food and drink a lot of which of course would have featured on the, the skills needed in, in that sector I think the work he has now been tasked uh, with doing is really important um, and it's important I think in any review like that that we uh, give it time and space to do its work, but we learn as we go as well and make sure that these issues are being addressed on an ongoing basis. Okay, I'm going to come to Sue Weber now. Thank you, uh, Convener, and good afternoon, First Minister. Carrying on with the theme on the reform agenda, when the Education, Children and Young People Committee heard from the Chief Executive of the SQA recently, we learned that many of the existing SQA staff were going to be represented on the various programme and delivery boards 
created to drive forward much needed educational reform. So how can we expect meaningful transformation change to actually take place when it's the same people charged with designing the replacement bodies for the SQA and Education Scotland who are so heavily invested in perhaps some could say defending current ways of working? First Minister. I think, again, there is always a really tricky balance to, to strike here between trying to reform and do things better, which is the purpose of the uh, programme of reform that, that you're asking me about right now, but also making sure that we don't lose the expertise and the skills and the, the learning and the knowledge that often has built up over a long period of time. And, and I think it is right and proper that we harness uh, that uh, as we take forward this reform agenda. But of course, there'll be, not least from your committee and the parliament as a whole, there'll be you know, a lot of scrutiny on that. You know, that's going to be uh, legislation and uh, require legislation. And there'll be a lot of scrutiny on that and the wider policy to make sure, I hope, that we're getting the balance of that right. Sue Weber. On, in, in part of that reform to the education, is the Scottish Government has also launched its national discussion on education designed to seek the views from children and young people between the ages of 3 and 18. Um, however, bodies like the SQA have been heavily criticised in the past as their attempts to include young people in decision-making process have led to disappointing experiences for our young people and those that were involved. What reassurance can you provide that the children and young people's views will actually contribute to the educational reforms in a meaningful way? And how will you ensure that it's a positive experience for children and young people and that they receive clear, clear feedback as to what they have fed in and how it is contributing to that reform agenda? First Minister. I mean, the national discussion, I know I'm uh, telling you things you, you know here because your committee is uh, very intimately interested in this. It's, the national discussion is co-convened by the Scottish Government and uh, COSLA. I think the Cabinet Secretary has already met with education spokespeople from all different parties, inviting on that cross-party basis uh, input and contribution and is intending to encourage all MSPs to take part in that. The, the voice of children and young people is designed to be and uh, will be at the heart of that. That was one of the, when Ken Muir made the recommendation for a national discussion, uh, that was one of the, the key factors that young people had to be at the heart of that. Um, and, you know, there will always be, in any process like this, there will always be uh, individuals or particular interests who understandably feel that their views are not properly being taken into account because they perhaps disagree with the direction of travel. But this will be uh, an effort to ensure that those who are essential to building uh, the vision for the future of Scottish ed education have the opportunity to make uh, a full contribution. Uh, there's going to be a lot of uh, high profile public engagement activity trying to ensure as wide ranging participation as possible. OK, I'm going to come to Claire Adamson, who's going to lead off some questions around the constitution. Issues. Thank, you. Thank you very much. Um, First Minister, last week our committee published a report on an inquiry into the impact of Brexit on devolution. The committee's findings demonstrate that there are fundamental concerns which need to be addressed in relation to how devolution works outside of the EU. One of the key areas was around regulatory divergence and with the recent introduction to the Commons of the Genetic Technology Precision Breeding Bill, uh, this is an example of where <coughs> divergence might occur. Um, given their concerns, can I ask the First Minister just to reflect on the, the published report and this key area of divergence? First Minister. Um, I, I welcome the report. I thought it was a, a good report with lots of uh, important things to say. Um, I, I don't think I'm going to uh, grab any headlines today by saying that I don't believe the powers of this parliament are, are strong or extensive enough. And while I suspect uh, I'll have your agreement on that, other people will disagree. I think what should concern us all, regardless of party or actually regardless of our perspective on the constitution, is the erosion and undermining of the current existing powers of this parliament. I think we see that and it's 
Uh, particularly relevant to your point about um, undercutting of regulatory standards, the Internal Market Act is you know, a very serious and very real concern um, in that regard. Uh, the EU retained law uh, provisions uh, are also worrying, not least because they are going to tie up uh, this Parliament's time and energy and legislative time unnecessarily as we try to protect and replicate uh, standards that already exist and shouldn't be under any question at all, and as we do that, have the Internal Market Act potentially uh, preventing us from doing that. So these are, are real concerns. They, they sound often very abstract about you know, powers and standards and regulation, but you, you talked about uh, you know, genetically modified products and things. They are they're real for people. They are about you know, cleanliness of, of beaches, they are about sewage, they are about the quality and the standard of the food that we eat. They really matter to people. And this parliament, if we are not very careful and unite against it, is going to find our ability to protect these standards increasingly undermined and eroded. Okay. Um, uh, one of the features of our report is, is the work that we have undertaken through the Interparliamentary Forum, but also um, taking evidence um, from Wales as well. And, and, and these are concerns that aren't just um, being voiced by committees of this parliament. Um, the same as with the Welsh parliament. And when Stormont was working, they had similar concerns as well. So, um, And as you said, it is a very abstract thing. And until people get a hook onto something that's going to affect them, it's difficult to get this. But um, uh, can I just ask what, what, what work you have done um, with, with the other... Um, nations to actually um, and devolve legislatures to actually um, talk about how, how we can resolve some of these very, very fundamental concerns. I think it was Professor Nicola McEwen said that the Civil Convention was fine until it was tested and now we're being tested. First the Conven Civil Convention has just been broken on, I think I've lost count now, how many times it has been completely disregarded. Um, these the, the the strength or otherwise of these conventions uh, is never tested when there's agreement. It's tested when there's disagreement, and that's when you see whether there is respect, and, and we've seen that there isn't any respect. Um, in terms of your question about work with other devolved administrations, I mean, that, you know, I may be exaggerating slightly to say that it is it's on a daily basis, but it won't be much less than that. Uh, we coordinate, obviously, given the issues around Stormont just now, more regularly with uh, the Senate and with the Welsh Government. In fact, I was discussing the EU retained uh, law bill with the First Minister of Wales in Butte House just yesterday. It was one of the key issues that we were discussing, the impact uh, on our respective administrations, how we work together to try to uh, mitigate against that impact, how we work together to try to find ways of protecting uh, these standards and protecting our parliaments against what will otherwise be a very serious erosion, erosion of our ability to uh, insist on the highest standards. Okay, I'm conscious of um, time pressing on the number of issues we need to uh, cover. I'm now going to move on to budget questions and I'm going to invite Audrey Nicholl to kick off this session. Audrey. Thanks very much, Camino, and my apologies for arriving uh, late. I've just come out of, of committee. Um, First Minister, in May of this year, the Cabinet Secretary for fin Finance and Economy set out our proposals for spending over the next five financial years. And broadly speaking, within the criminal justice sector, um, it will receive a flat cash settlement, which obviously, given uh, our high level of inflation at the moment, will place uh, significant pressures on the budget for our prisons, uh, courts and uh, police and fire services. So I just wonder if um, you recognise this pressure and uh, do you have any proposals to ameliorate uh, the effect on the sector, given that, for example, prisons have no option but to obviously receive uh, convicted persons from courts and police officers and fire uh, service personnel, personnel can't just stop um, turning up at calls? First Minister. So, first of all, I absolutely recognise the pressure on uh, the justice sector and the, the different organising organisations and agencies within our justice sector, but that pressure is felt right across our public services uh, right now, so it's, it's very real, um, and uh, we seek to respond as far as we can within the, the budgetary constraints we have. Um, it does make it all the more important, and budgetary pressures are not the only reason for this, but it budgetary pressures do um, reinforce the need for sensible reform in the delivery of public services. So in justice, what it reinforces the need for 
uh, a greater uh, focus on prevention, on community uh, outcomes and, and community disposals, on some of the reforms we've seen um, around uh, access to justice, digital online access to justice, for example. So some of the work we're doing, whether that's on uh, community justice, uh, reform of bail and remand, um, or you know, digital solutions to, to some of this, important for other reasons, but actually even more important given the budgetary constraints that are faced. Audrey Nicholl. If I may, thanks very much, Convener. Um, if I may just pick up on that point around sort of reform, um, I wonder if you would agree that at this most sort of challenging time, um, it also represents an opportunity for a kind of radical rethink, if you like, of the uh, criminal justice system to tackle um, some of the long-standing problems, such as uh, the numbers of people held in prisons, for example, particularly on remand, our backlog of court cases, uh, and the expectations that we place on emergency services personnel from developing trends such as policing mental health incidents in communities where there is a role for other sectors um, playing a part within that as well. First Minister. Um, there's lots in that question and I think there is lots uh, being done and um, planned to be done around some of this. So, I mean, if, if I look back over the last you know, decade and a half since uh, we've been in government, we've seen a lot of reform uh, that has had you know, a positive impact, whether that is on prevention, rehabilitation. So we you know, see uh, some of the lowest crime rates that we've seen in, in decades. We see uh, lower rates of reoffending, which suggests that that work is, is having an impact. We're also, and have also been trying to support as much uh, what I'll describe as, as multi-agency working around uh, some of these things. You know, and, and there's lots of examples of that, mental health, Councillors in you know, police stations, for example, which is, is something we're trying to continue to, uh, to do more of, or you know, the, the fire service uh, with defibrillators, and particularly in rural areas, going to emerge. So all of that is, is really important. There's more to be done, and the Vision for Justice sets out a lot of the steps that we want to, to take in future. Um, and you know, some of what I've already talked about in, in terms of community justice disposals, often controversial because you know the, there are people who will paint that as being weak on crime uh, when it's not you know Scotland has um, I think still the highest prison population proportionately of any country in the, the western world we're not weak on crime uh, what we need to get better at is even better at is preventing crime um, and uh, rehabilitating offenders and reducing uh, reoffending um, and that comes to some of the current proposals uh, that are being looked at around uh, how we use bail uh, with more uh, electronic monitoring of bail, for example. So there's a huge reform agenda in this space. Um, it focuses on justice, but it does bring in other agencies if we are to make that work overall. OK, I'm going to ask uh, Kenny Gibson. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. First Minister, the central scenario in the Scottish Government's medium-term financial strategy, published in May this year, which uh, does seem like a lifetime ago now, uh, factors in a 2% annual pay award for public sector workers, where the Bank of England expects inflation to reach 13% by the end of this year. So how will the Scottish Government find the money, uh, given the chaos imposed by the Chancellor last Friday, to ensure uh, public sector workers receive pay increases necessary to meet rising living costs? First well, I mean, that is in a large part what the emergency budget review is, is seeking to, to deal with. Um, you know, I've, I've mentioned the inflation erosion of our budget, the £1.7 billion, which is really significant. But pay deals to date, and some significant pay uh, negotiations, of course, are still underway, but I think pay deals to date um, are costing in the region of £700 million more than was budgeted for when we passed the budget. So, you know, you don't have to spend too long thinking about the impact of that to realise that it is substantial. Now, to be very clear, I think it's right and proper at a time of soaring inflation that we do everything we can to give public sector workers a decent pay rise. I don't think public sector pay is something we should be trying to 
bear down on for the sake of it. I want to give public sector workers a decent pay rise, but we have to be able to pay for it. And that is why some of the difficult decisions that we've already been talk talking about here are inescapable for us. Uh, and the emergency budget review is seeking uh, to make sure that we can free up the resources in our budget to fund exactly that and other ways of supporting people. Kenny Gibson. Okay, so Scotland's income uh, tax receipts continue to grow more slowly than the rest of the UK, which, due to fiscal framework arrangements for block grant adjustments, has significant implications for future Scottish budgets. So, what action is the Scottish Government taking to grow the tax base and fully utilise other devolved tax powers to ensure the sustainability of Scotland's public finances? First Minister. I think the latest outturn for Scottish income tax indicated that revenue exceeded uh, the block grant adjustment in 2020. Um, which actually has the effect of meaning more money for us to invest in public services, but there is uh, challenging uh, projections in, in future years. Um, this question really relates back to your last question to me in, in large part is the work we're doing principally through the strategy for economic transformation to sustainably grow our economy, to you know, create and support uh, high-skilled jobs, to widen and deepen Scotland's tax base um, and all of that work is critical to making sure uh, that our revenues for investment in public services stay strong. There is also the review of the fiscal framework underway. There are some inherent aspects of the fiscal framework that are uh, particularly challenging for devolved administrations and, and work against us and therefore in the context of that review, uh, even putting aside some of the the argument that we would make for greater fiscal flexibilities, I hope we'll be able to address some of these particular problems. Okay, I'm going to move on to um, equalities and invite uh, Joe Fitzpatrick to do the questioning. Thanks, Kavinar. Um, so, one of the first pieces of work the newly formed Equalities, Human Rights and Civil Justice Committee undertook was consideration of a petition to end conversion therapy. The committee's unanimous view was that conversion practices are abhorrent and are not acceptable in Scotland, and we concluded that they should be banned. So I was very pleased to see the commitment in the programme for government to bring forward a bill to end conversion practices. Can the First Minister provide an update on the Scottish Government's work in this area, and can the First Minister also confirm that this legislation will con cover conversion practices that seek to change people's gender identity as well as their sexual orientation, given the U-turn on this issue um, by the UK Government? First Minister. Well, firstly, just let me take the opportunity to say again that conversion practices are abhorrent. You know, they should have no place in a civilised society. Instead, we should be supporting people to be you know, happy as who they are and celebrating people for who they are, not seeking to uh, you know, deploy abhorrent practices to, to change who they are, uh, often deep, deep damage uh, to them in, in terms of mental health. Uh, so we have given the uh, confirmation in the programme for government that we will introduce a bill to end conversion practices. Uh, we intend to introduce uh, that bill by the end of 2023. Um, the commitment we've given will cover both sexual orientation and gender identity, and our very clear intention is that the bill will be as comprehensive as it can be within the devolved competence of this Parliament. And obviously, we will work very closely uh, with your committee as we take that commitment forward. I know the committee has already, as you've indicated, done. Uh, some work on this, so uh, that work will is already, and will continue to inform the detail of the approach that we take. Okay, Joe Fitzpatrick. Th thanks very much for, for that. Um, so another key aspect of our committee's longer-term work program um, that relates to the program for government is the uh, proposed human rights bill. Um, so the program for government sets out the Scottish government's intention to continue work developing the bill and also to consult on proposals for the bill. This would be a significant piece of work for our committee, so it would be good just to get an update on how that works going forward and um, perhaps also if First Minister could comment on how the recent developments regarding the scrapping of the proposed UK Bill of Rights will impact on the Scottish government's approach. First Minister. Well, first, I'll take those in reverse order. I welcome the shelving of the UK government's Bill of Rights. I mean, that would have dismantled fundamental human rights protections throughout the UK. So I, I welcome the fact that, for now, it appears to be off the table. Although I don't, um, I, I don't uh, take the view that it is necessarily off the table forever, and we need to wait and see what replaces it. And I think there is still 
a very real risk that it is replaced by something even worse, if, if that is possible. Um, I think we're, and again, I think this is an issue where there would be very uh, much, if not unanimous uh, views across this parliament, then quite a considerable degree of consensus that we're on a different trajectory to that, that we want to embed and protect human rights uh, within uh, the law in Scotland and within our uh, approaches uh, across the whole spectrum of, of policy making. Uh, so we intend, just in terms of the update, we intend to introduce the Scottish Human Rights Bill uh, later in this parliamentary session. Um, that bill will incorporate uh, different international human rights treaties, I think four human rights treaties. It's, it's complex, it's far-reaching, it's really important that we do that work properly, that we get the, the detail of that work right. Obviously, uh, our experience around the incorporation of the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child that, uh, is still an ongoing uh, issue, will inform uh, the approach that we take there as well. But it is a piece of work that we are absolutely committed to. OK, um, we're going to return to the issue of health and invite Gillian Martin to lead the question. Thank you. Very grateful for a second chance to ask a, a really important, uh, about a really important issue, which is about recruitment and retention of health and social care personnel, particularly in rural areas. It comes up in our committee a lot. We've got a number of petitions coming our way on it. It got mentioned in our winter planning session yesterday with uh, three health boards. Um, and. Uh, Yesterday, um, one of the chief executives from Dumfries and Galloway, he did reference the challenges around Brexit in particular um, and immigration. But within the powers of the Scottish Government, I'd like to ask the First Minister what the, the medium and, and long-term strategy is, given what you've just mentioned about a very tight labour market, a very uh, f f almost full employment in a situation where we do need more people to come into health and social care, particularly in our rural areas. First Minister. Let me deal with the issue in general and then maybe just a word or two about remote and rural areas. Uh, I mean, firstly, let's not um, forget the overall uh, situation here. We have record numbers of people working in the health service. We have across uh, most key uh, parts of the workforce, you know, proportionately more people working in our in NHS than, than other parts of the UK. That will partly be because of the particular challenges of delivering health care in remote, rural and, and island communities, but nevertheless that is the, you know, the pretty strong backdrop. But that is a workforce under significant pressure because of COVID, because of rising demand and the, the pressures that we are very familiar with in the National Health Service. Um, and therefore we need to continue to grow that workforce. Uh, we're seeking to support it and grow it in a number of ways, just very, very briefly. Big focus on trying to support the well-being of the existing workforce, because retention is important, um, as well as recruitment. Uh, but secondly, to recruit. So we have the uh, investment in international recruitment, which has been successful in, in recent times, and we want to recruit more people uh, internationally to augment uh, the workforce that we, that we have. And... Um, Clearly, Brexit has been a big uh, problem for us in that regard. I won't labour at that point right now, but that has uh, constrained uh, the, the pool of talent available uh, to, to the NHS. But nevertheless, we, we continue to focus on broader international recruitment. And obviously, pay is an important factor here and goes to both retention and, and recruitment. So, you know, this is a key... Yeah, you know, I obviously have, as well as my First Minister responsibility and experience spent a number of years as, as health secretary um, and if I look at the health service right now the health service would always benefit from more money if we had more money to, to give it um, but actually the bigger challenge right now for the delivery of health and care services is people and therefore we need to be absolutely uh, focused on that. Um, in terms of rural uh, and remote in particular, um, we have, as you will know, we have some incentive schemes, golden hello for uh, some uh, rural health care workers. We've got, uh, this is looking particularly at general practice, uh, the Scott Gem uh, graduate entry scheme. So seeking within our broader recruitment uh, initiatives to, again, as I said in uh, other issues later on, to recognise those particular challenges that exist in remote and rural areas. Okay, I'm going to ask uh, Siobhan Brown. 
Thank you, Convener. Um, the COVID-19 Recovery Committee has been really interested in the public health communication, um, particularly the rollout it will play in supporting the Autumn Booster Program, which is going to be very important as we approach another winter and COVID is still with us. Can I ask First Minister what level of uptake the Scottish Government is aiming for with the Autumn Booster and whether the figures so far suggest that it is on track to reach its target? First Minister. Well, we, we had very high uh, uptake of the, the previous rounds of COVID vaccination in some, uh, on some measures, the highest uptake rates in the UK. So we are seeking to achieve the same uh, level of vaccination. I think inevitably, as we go further through the pandemic and as perhaps you know, people's perception of the risk changes, we need to work even harder to make sure that there is a, a very broad based understanding of the vital importance of COVID vaccination. So anybody who is eligible for a booster this autumn should absolutely get it. And of course, uh, also get the flu vaccine if you're eligible for that as well, because flu is at a risk over this winter season um, as well. In terms of the performance to date, uh, in fact, Public Health Scotland is uh, publishing the first uh, data today. I am hoping I'm not about to get myself into horrible trouble. I think it was being published at uh, midday uh, in terms of the, the winter uh, vaccination campaign. And remember, these are very early uh, statistics. Uh, but as of the start of this week, uh, just short of 600,000 uh, autumn winter vaccines had been administered. Um, that breaks down as 288,000, just over 288,000 uh, COVID vaccines and just over 300,000 uh, adult flu vaccines. And 69.5% of older adult care home residents have received uh, their COVID booster already, which is important because that's the most clinically vulnerable at uh, getting protected first. Um, appointments for those aged over 65 uh, started at the start of last week and so far, according to the figures that are being published today, 17.4% uh, of those have received the COVID uh, winter booster. So I'm going to blame you, convener, if I've just uh, given these statistics out ahead of publication. But I'm, I'm doing it in the interest of transparency. With the I'll committee. just add it to my rap sheet, <laughs> First Minister. Um, right, we're going to move on, uh, probably appropriately, to justice questions again. Audrey Nicholl. Thanks very much, convener. Um, just earlier this month, the Lord Justice Clark spoke at an event with Rape Crisis Scotland on the progress being made to improve the prosecution of sexual offences and violence against women and girls. And she said that whilst very good progress was being made in some areas, wholesale reform was recommended to address the scale of the problem. So would the First Minister support that view and would she encourage all involved in taking forward a suite of major reforms to make this a priority? First Minister. Um, yes, firstly, I think the work that uh, Lady Dorian did in uh, this regard is, is really important. Um, lots of the recommendations she made um, are basically common sense that we need to take forward. Uh, some of her recommendations clearly much more controversial and some would require legislation. Um, I think she is right to say that we have made some progress, but I think she is probably even more right to say that there is still a significant journey to travel here. Um, to introduce reforms in the justice sector, and I mean that in the widest sense, that improve the experience of uh, those who you know, have experienced sexual uh, violence or sexual abuse in the criminal justice sector, but also to consider and pursue some of the wider societal changes that are needed um, to, to reduce that kind of crime, but also improve the, the experience of those who find themselves in the criminal justice system as victims of that kind of crime. Um, so there's, there's lots of work to be done here. As I say, some of it is legislative work that will be controversial. You know, we announced the, uh, that we will move to abolish the, the not proven Verdict. Now, that will come with a package of, of different reforms to ensure that we continue to have the required safeguards within our criminal justice system. But some of these things, um, in my view, and I'm, I'm a convert on the, the not proven, I, you know, probably uh, for a long time uh, as a, a former law student being told that the not proven verdict was one of the key uh, you know, unique aspects of the criminal justice system, took a lot of convincing on that. I am now a convert to that being an important thing to do uh, to improve access to justice for uh, victims of, of sexual crime in particular. It's not the only reason for doing it. Uh, 
obviously, Lady Doreen also made some recommendations around uh, certain uh, types of trial not having juries, for example, all much more controversial, uh, but we are taking forward uh, a number of uh, potential changes in a consultation and will consider all of these things carefully. Okay, thank you. I'm going to ask uh, Claire Adamson to um, lead some questions on Ukraine. Thank you very much. Um, First Minister, the um, uh, Super Sponsor Scheme is now supporting, I believe, over 18,000 Ukrainians in, in Scotland, um, a far bigger number than was originally committed to. Um, can I ask what progress has been made in some of the capital programmes that are aimed at bringing buildings into use for homes for temporarily displaced Ukrainians? And is there any um, view in when the Super Sponsor Scheme might be able to reopen? Minister. Let me try and break that question down briefly. Firstly, uh, the figures every week uh, on the numbers of displaced Ukrainian people here come out on a Thursday morning. So these will, the figures I'm about to give, or the, the general uh, approximate figures I'm about to give, will be updated tomorrow. But um, there are around 18,000 displaced Ukrainians in Scotland. Of those, about 15,000 are here under the, the Scottish Government Super Sponsor Scheme. Now, for context, uh, that compares to an initial commitment we gave uh, to 3,000, so significantly ahead of that, which I think is absolutely right and proper. And of all of the, the total number of displaced Ukrainians in the UK, that accounts for, or Scotland currently accounts for, I think, 19.5%, so getting close to a fifth of all of the Ukrainians in uh, the UK are in Scotland. So I think that's important, and I think it is a credit to our public agencies and the population as a whole, and it underlines the determination that there is in Scotland for us to do everything we can to help Ukraine um, at its hour of, of need. There are lots of challenges involved in this, and I'm not going to pretend otherwise. Uh, we paused the, the scheme. Uh, Wales had paused their equivalent a bit before us. We've paused the scheme. We are still considering carefully when that can be restarted. Um, and Neil Gray will update Parliament uh, when uh, decisions are taken around that. And part of the, the challenge to enable that to, to happen, one thing that is, is important to understand, which I'm sure you do, is that though 18,000 people are here, there are more than that who have visas who could still travel, even although the, the scheme is paused because they got visas before the scheme was paused. So we may have many more yet to, to come. So we need to understand the flow of that and be sure of our ability to accommodate them temporarily as we then try to move people on into to sustainable accommodation. Uh, and finally, on the, that longer term part of your question, it's important to stress that not everybody who comes here under any of these schemes needs help with accommodation. Some of them will access their own accommodation. Um, but those who do, we have uh, got extensive temporary accommodation, but clearly we are very focused on trying to move people out of temporary accommodation into longer term. Different elements of that, uh, there is the, the private sponsorship and the matching process. The, the matching process has, you know, taken longer and been more cumbersome than I think anybody wanted it to be, but there's a lot of work being done by local authorities uh, and Neil Gray and government officials to, to speed that up. And then, lastly, there is the, uh, the work that we are doing to, to support the bringing into use uh, accommodation. So the uh, initiative we have supported to bring flats into accommodation, uh, the fund I announced in Parliament last week, uh, a capital fund of £50 million pounds to support more of that. This is, is hugely challenging. Um, but it is one of the main ways we can support Ukraine. And I think we have an absolute obligation to do it. And we'll continue to do our best to meet the challenges so we can continue to support as many Ukrainians as possible and, crucially, support them for as long as possible. We hope that's not for much longer, because they'll be able to go back to their own country sooner rather than later. Uh, but the focus on permanent accommodation is to ensure that we can give that support for as long as necessary. OK, I'm now going to move us on to our final area of questioning. It's around deliberative democracy and the workings of this parliament. I'm going to invite Jackson Carlo to lead off. Uh, thank you. Uh, first of all, this is slightly more abstract, I think, from all the kind of specific stuff we've been discussing this afternoon. But the Citizen Participation and Public Petitions Committee is taking forward a substantial inquiry into uh, participative and deliberative democracy at present. This builds on the commitment, the recommendations in the 
Commission for Parliamentary Reform in the last session of Parliament. Uh, commitments, I think, in your own party's manifesto and in the programme for government. Um, there's a very encouraging response. There are two significant residential events taking place here in October and November, and there's been uh, a very encouraging response from public wishing to participate in them. So I have two questions, one specific and the other discursive, and I hope you want to answer one at the expense of the other. Um, it would be helpful to know what the Scottish Government's response is to its own working group on institutionalising participation and deliberative democracy. The business manager has uh, promised us in June that there would be an early publication of your response, and it would be helpful to have a clearer definition of what an early response means now that we're about to go into October, because it would help inform, obviously, the work we are doing. And secondly, the discursive bit, do you have in your own mind an idea where the balance of all this should finally rest? Because clearly the inquiry raises expectations, and there is a sense that in order for this to have the kind of profound change to the kind of political architecture of Scotland that it could very well have would require some of the current institutions that hold power to be prepared to trade that power or decision-making process along the way. And that's the bit that I'm, or we're slightly concerned, may end up being an obstacle to actually trying to make the kind of progress that I think everybody initially was enthusiastic about achieving. First Minister, and can I remind you, some of us need to be in the chamber at two o'clock. <laughs> it's a brave man or person who asked me to answer a discursive question um, with a, a clock ticking, so well done for that. You might live to regret it. Um, I'll come back to the discursive, but just to uh, rise to the challenge of dealing with the detail point before I go into the long-winded, uh, rambling, discursive bit of my answer. Uh, the IPDD working report, I think, you know, we have welcomed it and we have given a commitment to coming back with a detailed response as, as soon as possible. So there is a process uh, underway right now of us considering uh, the IPDD recommendations. Uh, the extent to which we think they are appropriate for the, you know, the general ambitions we set out in this area and how we can you know, best use them to build on the work that's already been done around participatory and deliberative democracy. So this is the bit of the answer that I'm going to try to make sound specific, but it's perhaps not as specific as you want it to be. Um, we are uh, hoping and intending to publish that detailed response, uh, certainly before the end of this year, but the specific date um, is not uh, available yet. But it's, it's getting close to a, a detailed answer, uh, but I suspect you will think I've... I've still, I've still got work to do on that. Now the discursive answer, presiding officer. Firstly, can I say, um, just as an aside on participative and deliberative democracy, um, I think referendums have an important role to play in that whole landscape. Uh, so it's perhaps a, an issue that we shouldn't uh, uh, allow to go by the wayside. Um, do I have a, a fixed view in my own mind of where the right balance is? I, I, I don't think I do. And I'm, I'm not sure it would be right for anybody to have a, a fixed view because I do think some of the issues on this are, are quite profound for the reasons you set out. Because if you increase general participation in democracy in a way I think we would all like to do, and we've already as a government made some use of citizens' assemblies, for example. And then if you go beyond that to the deliberative part of it, which at least implies decision-making or decision influencing, then that has immediate impact on you know, this institution. You know, where does that come up against the, the role of a parliamentary committee or the, you know, the, the decision-making uh, role of a government or a, a parliament? So I, I think these are really exciting and, and quite um, uh, sort of invigorating questions to consider. But I, I really think it's important that, that politicians probably particularly governing politicians, don't try to become too prescriptive too early on where the right uh, balance should be struck. And secondly, and this will be my last point, uh, I promise you, uh, convener, I'm not sure we'll ever get an abs... If we're genuine about deepening participative and deliberative democracy, do you ever get to a point where you think, well, that's it, there's no, there's no further development and progress that can be done. I don't know, maybe you don't. Maybe it is something that is always, in a sense, evolving. Um, there you go. That was me at my discursive Excellent. best or worst, whatever mm. your 
uh, perspective? Well, but the only thing I would really encourage, obviously, given that there is a substantial inquiry underway, is if, well, obviously early wasn't quite what the business manager meant in June, but if we could avoid being what might be defined as late, then that would be very helpful in terms of the government's response. <laughs> Should not go into too much of a, a sort of a, a diversion about the sort of expanding nature of seasons sometimes when you're talking about um, government responses to things. Um, I will feed that back um, and see if we can uh, turn the end of this year into something that is closer to the autumn than the start of winter. Excellent. I'm Martin Whitfield. Thank you, convener, and good afternoon, First Minister. And really following on, certainly in the, in the, in the light of the previous question, um, I very much welcome your comments about no further development because obviously I'm going to turn to the institution of the Parliament itself. And I think it's very important that during the questions that you've answered today, you've talked about the importance of debate, you've talked about the importance of questioning in front of Parliament. And indeed, you've also talked about um, the protection of Parliament. I um, know you will have, uh, and I emphasise that carefully, know you will have had an opportunity to look at the recent report which builds on the hybrid nature that was forced upon this Parliament and to which those that work within this Parliament and those in the previous session stepped up to make sure that parliamentarians in Scotland could participate during the COVID pandemic in more ways um, than I think any other Parliament around the world, which I think is much to its credit. But we need to look forward over towards the next 10 years. So really, in the light of um, allowing you a discursive answer, um, how do you view the changes that are being proposed for the Parliament? And um, in particular, uh, are you content um, that with, with observation and, 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 and oversight, the hybrid nature of the Parliament should continue to allow those, not just here, but those away from this place, to feel that they can participate in it. And to that end, um, about the question of voting, and in particularly proxy voting, um, I was going to say, can I invite you, uh, you're welcome to that, but let me just say, what are your thoughts on proxy voting and the importance of allowing all members of the chamber, at some stage when it's necessary, just to put aside the responsibilities of being an MSP for both themselves, their family, and for very good reason, but for those that have sent them here by election still to see their vote count in this parliament. First Minister. Um, so thank you. Uh, I suppose I'll, I'll preface my answer here, and I will try to keep it as succinct uh, as I can, by saying, and this will sound like me dodging the question, I'm, as you will see, I'm not going to try to dodge the question, but I actually do think it's really important that, that parliament and not government decide how a parliament operates, because you know, parliaments are there, not exclusively, but a significant part of Parliament's job is to hold government to account. And the way it chooses to do that and the format that it uses for that really should be up to Parliament. So I, I will kind of hold back by, from being too definitive in what I think should happen. Um, generally, I think the, the experience of hybrid working uh, has been a positive and a good one, and I think it should continue in some form. It's my view I'm expressing here. It's not for me to decide. Whether it continues in exactly the form that we used during COVID, I think is another question altogether. And I think we've already seen changes and developments. So for example, if I was, um, I am a minister obviously, but if I was somebody trying to hold a minister to account, I would, wouldn't want that only be to be with a minister on a screen there where I couldn't interact or try to intervene. And I know there's been changes to try to facilitate a, a more uh, sort of interactive form of debate, even when somebody is is on remote, uh, participating remotely. So I, I think we've got to uh, make sure that we don't erode what I think, and often I experience it uncomfortably, is the, the quite intense scrutiny uh, of a minister being physically in a parliamentary chamber being held to account. So, you know, that's, that's one point in terms of the hybrid nature of debates or, or question time <coughs> sessions. Um, in terms of Online voting, I, I do think, I, I think I'm more strongly of the view that we should continue to allow uh, online voting um, to some extent, whether it is, you know, completely unrestricted or whether it is, there are certain conditions around it, I think is for more detailed discussion. And yes, I do believe there should be provision for proxy voting where people have uh, particular circumstances where they cannot physically be there for you know, family illness or childcare or something like that. You know, we live in 
a modern world, and I think Parliament has to operate in a way that, that reflects that. So that's my views in general. Where the detail of all of that is drawn, where the lines are drawn around that, I do think it's important probably for Parliament, eh, definitely for Parliament rather than government, to, to be the decision maker. OK, thank you. And I'm going to invite Kenneth Gibson with a more specific question on the working in the Parliament to finish us off. Thank you very much. Uh, First Minister, with a public administration hat on, the committee explored with the Permanent Secretary recent criticism about the Scottish Government's approach to the recording of decisions responding to FOI requests, ministerial correspondence and written questions, and providing information to parliamentary committees and transparency over spending. How will you ensure that the Scottish Government enhances transparency, particularly of key policy decisions, to enable full and proper parliamentary scrutiny? First Minister. Well, I will seek to uh, preside over a government that is, in what it does, as transparent as possible. And in terms of uh, recording and storing, recording decisions, storing information, does that to the standards that would be expected. And you have heard from the permanent secretary uh, his determination to ensure that those standards are met. Um, I am also realistic enough to know that, um, in the heat of political debate, uh, no matter how transparent I think the government is being, there will be people who think we're not being transparent enough. And on occasion, they will be right, and we will need to reflect on that and and learn from it. Some, without going into the detail, although it, it goes to, I'm sure, some of what I will be talking to Richard and his committee about in the not too distant future, it is as frustrating for me, believe it or not, as it is for others in Parliament if, for example, we are not able to locate a particular piece of paper that evidences a, a decision and then later locate it. That's not in, in my interest. That, Kind of makes uh, the life of ministers seeking to uh, navigate issues and, and defend policies harder. So this is the bit that perhaps uh, opposition members will have a wry kind of raising of an eyebrow to, but it is true. It is actually, for a sensible government, and my government is sensible, um, for a sensible government, these things, transparency, good record keeping, being able to demonstrate at the basis on which decisions are taken, it's as much in the interest of the government as it is in the interest of those holding the government to account. So are we, ever, are we you know, ever going to get to a stage where we don't get some things wrong sometimes or that we're not subject to legitimate criticism? No, because you know, nobody is perfect. But are we absolutely determined to make sure that we are meeting the standards uh, expected then without a shadow of a doubt, yes. Thank you very much. Uh, First Minister, I can't believe I allowed a couple of discursive questions at the end of the session. We'll be uh, reviewing that, I think, in the post-match analysis. Can I thank you, First Minister, for your attendance and participation? Hopefully we can repeat this exercise in around uh, six months' time. But that uh, concludes the, the, the meeting. The next meeting will be Wednesday, the 26th of October. And I thank you all for your attendance. And with that, I close the meeting.